It is Monday, January the 11th, 2021. I'm Chris, this is Henry, and this is Curiously Polar. Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar. Um, Henry, how are you doing today? I'm great. We have the first proper snow this year. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, we only have cold. There's no snow here where I live. I can send you some. No worries. No, no, we'll we'll get we'll get our sh fair share of snow. Winter has just begun. Um, let's see. We uh, don't have an update about the Russian ship that lost a propeller blade <laughs> this time around. <laughs> but um, before we get into today's topic, we have a quick update from South uh, Georgia. There has been uh, news around the iceberg. Yeah, the British Antarctic Survey just sends uh, scientists down to South Georgia to execute some uh, assessment and research on I-68A. And oh, so they're actually remains. actual people are going down there now to actual people are going down. Out. There are already people going down. Um, there are already people down there, but um, the like core team of, of analysts and, and and scientists that research that iceberg, they are based in uh, England and they now finally um, set up an expedition in record time. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong button. Sorry for that. Um, uh, nothing happened. Nothing to see here. Move along. Um, so so yeah, this this is a pretty short, quick response time to send someone down there. Yeah, usually it takes years to set up expeditions yes. of, of of that scale, and um, now they just use the facilities. They they use the ship um, in the area and um, just go down there, and um, yeah, take the opportunity, which is very rare, to actually really research the the impacts and effects of um, such a huge chunk of ice, of of uh, fresh water in such saltwater ocean environments, and uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Mm. So there will probably definitely come uh, be things that come out of that. So I, th I think we are not we're not done with the uh, reporting on a sixty eight just yet. <sighs> so but today um, we have a much more exciting topic. To yes, make. we do. Um, <laughs> so it's my turn today, and I'm I'm very happy about this that finally I get to say things here. Now the. the <laughs> Here's how here's how I found out about this story today. I listened to an episode of one of my favorite podcasts called Ologies, uh, made by Ellie Ward. She uh, she in that podcast she talks to experts in their fields, like dot 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 ologists. That's where the title comes from: psychologists or biologists and so on. And um, in that episode of her, of her podcast, she talked to an archaeologist and. Uh, a very special archaeologist, a space archaeologist. I, I, this, I, I promise this will come back to the, the Arctic topics here. Um, because it turns out that there are a lot of like weird artifacts flying around uh, the Earth up there. And of course, in that episode, they talk about satellites. And then they, they talked about Cosmos 954. And that Cosmos 954 once almost caused a nuclear disaster in the Arctic. So... Um, that's where my ears perked up, and I said, like, wait a minute, <clears throat> I have to look into that, and I'm a fan of sp everything space anyway, so I sent you a message, Henry, saying, go and kick me, I can I, can I, can I do this? And yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, for once. And it's, it's, it's closely connected to nuclear disasters, which <clears throat> we were covering which, which is, yeah, briefly. <laughs> which, which uh, again, nuclear uh, ships losing propeller blades. Uh, a Soviet nuclear <laughs> ship losing pro There's a slight connection there. So the Soviet Union has many satellites or had many satellites in space uh, when it was the Soviet Union. And uh, the, the Russians still have a lot of satellites up there. And for a long time, of weather satellites, uh, satellites for um, Earth observation. Um, today, up there is GLONASS, which is the Russian version of the GPS system, um, <clears throat> and of course military satellites. And uh, one satellite program that had, and I think still has, satellites up there, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, so I'm trying my <laughs> best here, um, but I think the RORSAT, R-O-R-S-A-T program is still up there. At least some satellites is called the RORSAT means Radar Ocean Reconnaissance Satellite. So that's a 
I would think probably military slanted satellite, they observe ocean traffic. They like surf surface vessels, nuclear submarines, these kind of things. They are uh, trying to track from those Rosat satellites. And um, now I think the Rosat program isn't up there anymore because I think it officially ended in 1988, but then officially. Okay, so um, let's just leave it at that. But um, between 1967 and 1988, there were 33 Soviet satellites in that Rosat program. And one of them was Cosmos 954. Remember that name, you'll hear a lot about this in this episode. Um, <clears throat> Cosmos 954 was a Soviet Marine reconnaissance satellite. It was launched in September 77, and that's also an important date. Um, they launched it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and it's a satellite that was in pretty low Earth orbit. And uh, so, so low that the, it orbited Earth around every 90 minutes. So uh, it's a very fast flying satellite. Uh, actually quite a bit lower than uh, ISS today. Um, the ISS is about four, 400 kilometers, 250 miles high. And uh, Cosmos 954 was under 300 kilometers, under 190 miles. So it was going faster than ISS today. And of course, that has some some side effects because um, a satellite like this needs power, needs power to operate, and it also needs power to keep itself in orbit. Because at that altitude, believe it or not, there is atmospheric drag. There is still enough of an atmosphere to slow down satellites very slowly, but they will get slower. So you will need some power source to lift it up back to its satellite. ISS does this too. So um, they sink very slowly, but then they come back up again or they are lifted back up again through a power source. Now that satellite was intended for very long-term use. And uh, then the question is, of course, you need some sort of fuel. And there are no gas stations in orbit, at least none that I know of. So you need a decent power source on board and if you look at satellites today, they often have solar arrays and batteries as power sources. Um, but all the 33 raw sats were powered by nuclear reactors. That's where, <laughs> that's, that's where my, my first alarm bells go off. So <clears throat> the... So just, let's, let's summarize. We have 33 low orbit satellites, which are constantly dragged into the atmosphere and their fuel source is a small nuclear reactor on board. Small, yeah, smallish. Well, the the, the reactor of K, of uh, Cosmos 954 contained 50 kilos of uranium 235. Or uranium, 50 kilogram of uranium. Yes, 110 pounds. Um, uranium 235 has a half life of about 700 million years. It's also called <laughs> weapons grade uranium. It was used in the Hiroshima bomb. And one thing is for sure, you don't really want this uh, come down to Earth. You want this away from Earth. And if you look at what's, what's being done with satellites, especially ones that have dangerous stuff on board, um, at the end of a satellite's life, you have pretty much two main options. First, you deorbit it, which means you push it towards Earth so it gets even more drag from the atmosphere and then it, it just falls back to Earth and it will burn up in the atmosphere. That's the normal hopefully. way. Well, hopefully. Um, but even if not everything of a satellite burns up, the chances of of being hit by satellite debris um, are minuscule. I mean, the Earth is mostly sea. And uh, um, so I don't think there are any any recorded events where someone was killed by being hit by a piece of a satellite. I don't think that happens. Um, so yeah, you incinerate it. That's pretty much the first option. And the second option, especially if the deorbiting will cost you too much energy, or if you don't, don't have that energy, or if you don't want something to come back down to Earth, like a nuclear reactor, you can move it to a special place out there that's called a graveyard orbit. This I learned this all it's an from amazing term, isn't I, it? <laughs> yeah, it's also called a junk orbit or disposal orbit. But I like graveyard orbit, um, and that's that that's directly from that ologies episode, which we are going to link, of course. 
And there are several. How high is that? <clears throat> yeah, there are several uh, graveyard orbits, and they are far away from operational orbits where satellites are that do things. Um, there's one at 36,100 kilometers up there. That's like 22,400 miles. So compare that to the 190 miles that uh, Cosmos uh, thingy 954 was on. So it's really far away. And out there, <laughs> those orbits are full with uh, satellites that aren't in service anymore. So so that's basically like the yeah the, the rest in peace place for all those um yeah not not only satellites but also remains of the old space stations and, and stuff. Yes, and and of course there's also space junk in other orbits that's not supposed to be there, and there are there's like huge programs up, up on Earth that track all these pieces of debris so they don't get too dangerous for well the ISS for example because there's people on there but also other satellites that are important. So, back to the nuclear reactor in, in Cosmos 954. The Rorsat satellites had a mechanism so that at the end of their lifespan, they could detach their nuclear reactor from the rest of the satellite and propel it, the, the reactor core, the dangerous bit with the uranium, out to that graveyard orbit so it wouldn't come back to Earth. And... So you, let's get into the timeline. Um, Cosmos 954 was launched in September 1977. And then three months later, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, who are one of their tasks is to track Soviet satellites back then, and probably still is, they noticed that Cosmos 954 was making some quite erratic maneuvers. Its orbit changed up to like 50 miles up and down. And that's a lot when you when your orbit is only 190 miles high. So, and then in secret meetings, Soviet officials warned the United States that they had lost control over Cosmos 954. They told them, hey, so excuse me, friends. <laughs> but what was worse is that the system to launch the reactor the reactor core to that graveyard orbit had failed too. So there's an out of control satellite that it launched in September 1977, October, November, December. So three months later, yep, there's an out of control satellite up there with a nuclear reactor on board. Um, and then one month later, in January 1978, Cosmos 954 began re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And um, and while the Soviets first claimed it had like completely burned up during re-entry, so no danger, it all burned up, it turned out uh, that uh, debris from Cosmos 954 ended up being scattered on Canadian territory along uh, a pr pretty long, like 370 mile long corridor, 600 kilometers long in Alberta in Saskatchewan, and in what's today the Nunavut territory. So we talked so about pretty much that. all Arctic territories <clears throat> of Canada. Yeah, or, or territories that reach into the Arctic. So there is definitely an Arctic connection there. So what do you do? You have 600 kilometers of uh, stretch um, full of or, or with pieces of very dangerous um, radioactive material on Earth. So there was a big effort to recover radioactive material out there, and uh, they called it Operation Morning Light. So if you Google that, you'll find a whole lot of information. But do you know how they came to that title? Um, no, I don't. Do you? Yes, they ran actually a computer program, and I was really questioning if that computer still works and comes up with all those beautiful operation titles. Is there a computer program, program that, that came? <laughs> yes. So it's like it's like a, I, I, I know a website that has like all sorts of fantasy name generators for role playing and so on. That uh, it's probably the same computer. It's probably the same program. <laughs> operation Morning Light. So they they covered with this operation they covered a total area of one hundred and twenty four thousand square kilometers. That's forty eight thousand square miles that they searched through. There was a Canadian American team that swept the area on foot and by air for nine months. And they recovered 12 large pieces of that satellite, 10 being very radioactive. 
And those radio, um, those radioactive. Okay, so just to give you an idea how much radioactivity. Those pieces showed radioactivity of up to 1.1 sieverts per hour, or nine kilo sieverts per year. Now, if you look at the official limits, uh, the EPA limits the yearly release of a nuclear power plant to 250 millionth of a sievert per year. So take one sievert, cut it into uh, a million pieces, take 250 of those, and that is how much a nuclear power plant can emit in the United States. These these individual pieces, some of them emitted nine kilo sieverts per year. So that's that's a lot. Let's let's just say that's a quite a big lot. And um, they also only found 1% of the total fuel of Cosmos 954. So question is, is the rest, has the rest really burned up or is there still stuff so out there? There might still be a chance to have some remains of the uranium fuel stick somewhere spread over the yeah. Canadian territories. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a chance for that. I have no idea how big the chance is. I don't want to uh, cause any any fear. There's enough fear in the world right now. But um, yeah, and this is and this is from 1978. So it's been a long time, and I would suspect that uh, whatever's out there has been found by now. So anyway, um, let's look at the aftermath. What happened after this? Because, of course, um, uh, there's 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 laws out there. Believe it or not, there's laws that cover what happens if, like, uh, a, a, what what who's in charge here? Who's who's responsible here? There's a state that launches an object into space, which is dangerous, and does the laws say the whatever international satellite laws? I don't know what they're called. Say, says apparently says that uh, the state that launches an object into space is liable for the damages caused by that object. Very logical, right? You you fire a rocket up in your garden, it falls on your neighbor's house. It's probably your responsibility. So. Uh, if you so if if your satellite falls in someone's house, you probably have to pay for it. So the Canadian government billed the Soviet Union six million Canadian dollars for the recovery effort and for future expenses. <laughs> um, it, the lengthy story. And in do the they end, actually pay? Well, the Soviet Union paid three million dollars, so they paid half of this. That's um, kind of the end of That's the story. Settlement. So. Anyway, it's uh, yeah, it just uh, shows us that there's interesting, sometimes scary stuff around us. Um, by the way, there are other incidents. Uh, just to round this story off, Cosmos 954 was not the first nuclear-powered Rosat satellite to fail. Um, earlier in 1973, a similar satellite dropped its reactor into the Pacific Ocean north of Japan. So I don't know if it's still there. <laughs> and in 1983, the Cosmos 1402 dropped its reactor into the South Atlantic. So they have a history of, uh, the Rosats have a history of, yeah, not really. Malfunction? Yes, that's what you could call it. So um, after that third incident in 1983, they redesigned the back, or, or they added a backup ejection mechanism to the uh, nuclear core, so that uh, it that that shouldn't happen again, and it did uh, work once in 1988. Was another Rosat issue, and the backup mechanism that at that point successfully raised a nuclear core to that graveyard orbit. So, what's really mind-boggling uh, on this story is actually the the, the actual Operation Morning Light. Um, the incident was discovered in the United States first from uh, the NORAD um, station. And from the communication with the Soviet Union, they actually calculated where the um, satellite supposedly goes down. And through that, they actually went in contact with the Canadian government and they both decided to keep a low profile and not um, alarm people because you always have to keep in mind the areas 
um, where the debris of the satellite might have come down is populated. There are people living there, even though it's sparsely populated, but yes. it's populated. Yes. And actually, the, the largest chunk of the debris came down in the Great Slave Lake, which is straight at the edge of Yellowknife. The largest in the Northwest Territories and the largest settlement there. Yep. So this operation brought together the military uh, resources of the United States and Canada. And that was the first time that I like, actually went in direct contact. It was not really just like a, a, a dry training. It was actually the first time they, they came in contact with radioactive material, the military um, services that were actually supposed to protect um, the the population. So they went out there in the harshest conditions, and that's something really amazing. And there, the the Arctic um, topic just links together. It's something nobody really was prepared. So the first and uh, foremost thing of that operation was preparation of those uh, people going out into the operation and um, just yeah, be able to survive that long operation because as you said chris it was a long undergoing it was just not a few weeks they actually spent month there and they really um tried to yeah roam through the entire area um which was yeah the, the possible debris area to find that radioactive debris because that actually really is a hazard it's not about um protecting technology it's about the the natural hazard for population and that's a, a pretty amazing outcome of that operation. They could, of course, not keep it quiet. So it weren't oh, way too big. Around. Way too big for that. Yes. <laughs> it was way too big, exactly. Particularly, you need to to involve the sparsely populated um, settlements there. So you, you need to involve the the communities and tell them if you find something that looks technical, don't touch it. Might be radioactive. Might kill you. So. By that, it's just spread and it became a huge media event back in the days. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it, it was everything but secret at a point. And uh, that was a, a very interesting outcome. So you, you find quite some some um, pop culture uh, references to that Operation Morning Light. Yeah. So, yeah, what can we learn from that? Always look, <laughs> always look up. <laughs> Always wear, always bring an umbrella. I don't know, but um, there's more happening than we than we know. At least uh, until it becomes too big to hide. So, <sighs> which which is and which is not helpful in a time of conspiracy theories. So <sighs> certainly not. But for me, the the, the major thing in, in in this topic was to find out that there used to be satellites operated on nuclear power which uh, i knew how? which i knew there there i didn't yeah um, th th like if you look at if you look at something like the the rovers on mars they have a nuclear power source because they are just so far away but even a satellite just just 190 mi miles above you is you cannot refuel it at least not uh, in a in a cost effective way so you have to have a power source that lasts for whatever the mission is designed for um, and and solar isn't always uh, an option, I guess. At least for at least back in 1977, maybe today they are more power efficient, and maybe people have wisened up a bit to not put that kind of stuff up there above us. And the, my, one of my big learnings from this um, from this episode was the graveyard orbits. That there are multiple graveyard orbits where they put things they don't want back on earth and they are like safe up there they don't need to be propelled they just stay up there so um earth which is really interesting for future space missions when you think about um, oh, population of mars and that kind of things it's already uh there again as i said there are tracking uh, services that that track debris in space and that know at least for most of these things where they are and uh um they they are definitely in the mix, in the calculations when you look at trajectories to get away from Earth to Mars or to Moon or wherever. So, um, yeah, you don't want to run into a satellite that's out there. And while this is, I mean, if you look at maps and at life trackers of satellites, you, it looks very crowded. It is still not as crowded as you think it is. So the chances are small 
that you hit something, but they are there. And of course you kind and of... And the speed they're traveling is just a danger. Uh, the lower, it's the really... faster. I mean, we're, we're yeah. looking at, I mean, the, the, the weightlessness that the, that the astronauts in the ISS have is not real weightlessness. It's just that they are falling in free fall, um, but they are falling sideways so fast that it feels like they have, they're weightless, but uh, actually they're falling all the time in free fall. So oh, I you, just, sorry, go I ahead. just looked up the, the power source of the, uh, the Mars rover. And just to put that in relation, the Mars rover has 10.6 pounds, which is a little less than five kilograms mm -hmm. of plutonium dioxide as a power source on board. The satellite had 50 kilogram. And like and uranium and and the, re and uranium. And the weapons grade uranium, which is which, as far as I know, is not enough to. Um, I, I looked this up in in this in this uh, the research for this. <laughs> I, I I don't just know that, but fifty pounds or no fifty kilos of 50 uranium to thirty five is is not quite enough to um, to build a bomb. So you need. Well, that's. You, you need to either compress Reassuring. it really, really well, or give it more. Like the, it, it's not yet beyond critical mass. So, anyway, I think let's just leave it here. I've, yeah, I don't <laughs> think we can have a very positive conclusion, other than maybe someone learned from that and doesn't put uranium two thirty five up in space anymore. But back so, in the days, that was uh, drawing quite some attention towards the Arctic regions <laughs> of yes. Canada. Pretty, yes. pretty awesome. Yes, it was. So, it, yeah, that's just uh, one episode in the Arctic. Um, I'm quite happy that nowadays uh, I can be up there without having to, well, without having to have too much fear of things like that. <laughs> I think polar bears are more, more of a danger right now than uh, pieces of uranium. Let's hope. Hopefully. Probably more polar bears than pieces of satellites up there. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have like remarks, if we missed anything, um, or if our research went the wrong way and we said things that were incorrect, correct us. Let us know. We are online, of course, at all sorts of different places. We are on the Twitters and Instagrams at curiouslypolar.com. We have a website, curiouslypolar.com, where you can find um pretty much all episodes going back to episode one and uh yeah we'll be back in about a week from now until then everyone take care and bye 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 <laughs>